Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Heart's a pretty iconic band, and Nancy Wilson recently partnered up with Reverb to sell off some of her old guitars. Some of them pretty iconic, other ones kinda weird. So let's go ahead and go through these guitars. Starting with the Big Mac Daddy is a Gibson SG, appears to be a junior that had been modified, but how much is it? It's the most expensive thing in the shop, 100 thousand dollars so before we get into the history i mean let's just take a closer look at this thing because generally speaking this guitar right here without the artist affiliation isn't really all that expensive i mean you can go to reverb right now and find one for like two and a half thousand maybe a slightly cleaner one will run you close to four but it seems the market averages around three so let's find out what makes this worth a hundred big ones. Well, it looks like somebody has converted it from the wrap tail piece into a tunematic. That's actually fascinating and something I've never noticed before about these late 60s juniors. Their wrap tail is within the pick guard. <laughs> That's silly. So naturally that made that very easy for somebody to convert into a Nashville style bridge. And then you can see there's these holes right here. Those are the holes from the original Vibrolas that a lot of these had. However, it's not a secret those are not the best trems in the world, so it looks like it was upgraded to a B5 Bigsby, but they've got the Vibromate spoiler on it, so it's a lot easier to string up. And if we look at our pick guard, it's got a couple of chips off the side, but that helps show you how this didn't start life as a mahogany colored SG. It was cherry, like you can see here and in these corners. It's just faded from all the use. Now these knobs are also non-original because obviously they've been used a lot, probably needed to be replaced after fall off or perhaps because she's playing on a dark stage she wanted to have two different knobs on here so she knew which one was the volume and the tone just by feel but then we move on to the back it says united states marine corps support our troops not those who misled them so this is basically a giant decal and it's iconic for anybody who saw heart on stage and we'll touch more on that here in a second but as far as the headstock goes nothing looks modified here and it appears that there might have been some finished touch-up work here so maybe there's a headstock repair we'll have to read the description but this thing was definitely used so now let's hear the rest of the tale this was Nancy's number one choice for live versions of Barracuda. And that's one of Hart's top songs, so obviously a guitar associated with that is very cool. But the decals on the back of this, she liked to flash those when she was playing it on stage. So that's why this is kind of an iconic piece. So if anybody else toured and gigged this guitar and they came to sell it on reverb, they might be lucky to get 2000 bucks for one in this kind of condition. And as of right now, this is still available, whereas a lot of other stuff sold instantaneously. But I mean, there's very few buyers in this price range so we'll have to see if it sells because it does have one offer on it but that's probably just some bozo offering a dollar but never never question artist owned and used tour gig stuff that's actually iconic but if something slightly half that price is a little bit more interesting to you guys we have an early prs guitar here for fifty thousand. however <laughs> It's a little bit strange looking because it's a 12 string and that's not the usual headstock you see on a PRS, but this is the very early days of Paul's creations here. I really like this makeshift string tree here that's just apparently a screw. <laughs> you don't even have a truss rod cover on this thing, but you still have your eagle up here and all the other birds going up and down the neck. But when you get down here, it's not a bird, it's a dragon. Now I'm sure we could call it Paul and get the whole story on, you know, what's the first dragon guitar that he made, but this is clearly one of the earlier ones. It may be not quite as crazy as the modern day dragons or things that have been birthed within the past 20, 30 some years. But what I really like about this one is just how experimental it is. You can definitely see a little bit more Gibson influence with the whole double cut juniors and specials that really inspired him to inspire his own designs off of those. And you can see the early parts of them carving away the guitar so you can easily get to the knobs but what's really fascinating to me is this it almost looks like this thing started life as having some sort of a trem <laughs> which is ridiculous for a 12 string but then maybe it was converted to this wrap tail it's either that or this was carved away on the body so it would sit a little bit more flush because that's a problem sometimes with wrap tail pieces they're just a little too big and boisterous they stick off the guitar too much so having that be able to be decked down gave you some really good action or the ability to raise and lower it to your heart content but then the pickup's kind of in a strange area in my opinion and then i like how the neck comes in here kind of prs santana style but oh okay here's a little more to the story so this must be like late 70s early 80s we're talking because we've got brass back plates here brass was huge back then for sustain so they must have a giant brass block through that and then you run all the strings with it so maybe that's the reason they have this cut out here but it looks like a nice piece of mahogany with kind of a interesting dragon it appears to be some sort of a water dragon the knobs are nice and aged 
I'll be curious what this one goes for, because that appeals to PRS collectors as well as heart fans. Number three here, I'm kind of sad about because I was thinking about maybe buying this guitar to review and document it. I mean, sure, it would be kind of cool to own Nancy Wilson's mini Les Paul and display that in the future museum, but Reverb was all, give us your email, we'll let you know when this shop's live. And then they proceeded to never email me about it. <laughs> but it ended up getting listed for 12,000 bucks anyways, and it sold very quickly. So we've talked about the Lotus Mini Les Pauls, we've talked about the Pee Wees, and maybe even a couple by Glary. Generally, these tiny guitars, they're not the best unless you have really heavy gauge strings on them, or a custom boutique builder actually spends some good time on them. And this looks like an example of that. So in order to make this not look completely silly, they opted for mini humbuckers on here because, you know, mini Les Paul kind of works. But then we've got this cool bridge on it, which tons of famous people have used. Whenever I see one of those, I always think about Kirk Hammett because he threw one of those things on his flying V. And even though the proportions aren't maybe 100% perfect here, I like the fact that they still put a pick guard on it, you still got a couple of knobs, and it's a full stop bar tailpiece set up. And it even has Nancy's name on it. But the ornamentation on the neck is nice. I love those heart inlays. Obviously, it works well for heart the band. The headstock, yeah, they couldn't get away with making stuff like that today. But I was really excited to see this. It actually has a one-piece flame maple neck. Schaller tuners, as were popular at that time. And it's a set neck construction, which is the coolest thing. But the description just makes me laugh. Only one of several made, according to Wilson. <laughs> That sentence is not helpful at all. I think they meant like only one of a few made, but apparently Howard Lease also was given one of these by the builder. But if you're intrigued by a set neck mini Les Paul, did you know Gibson actually made these back in the 50s? Yeah, check out this episode for that. But that was just a, a very well-crafted little baby Les Paul. Next up is a guitar that was also used on the stage, and it's a 1957 Fender Stratocaster that she says has the good dirt sound in it from the 50s. This has some interesting, like, space vibes to it in a way. And I say that because this wear area right here kind of reminds me of, like, a planet or something. And then it's a bit of a stretch, but, like, as the rocket takes off trying to get to space, it's kind of like burning up the atmosphere or something. As far as modifications, it looks like at least the bridge pickup has been changed, so maybe that's why she likes the dirt sound out of this thing, is because it's not the stock pickups. But it has a lot of nice wear and tear to it. It was definitely used quite heavily on stage, and that's what players prefer on these older guitars anyways. They don't want mint condition fenders, they want them all beat up like this. But wow, there's a reason why the Fender Custom Shop can make so much money relicking guitars. It's because they're trying to make it look like this, and feel like that. As far as body wear goes, I could care less, but it's really the neck. <laughs> that thing has seen a lot of showtime. However, the finish looks oddly pale. But hey, there we go, brass nut again! It's kind of strange that Reverb doesn't have the ability to, you know, have like CME look at these or some other Fender expert. I mean, when you're selling something for 50000 granted, the premium's mainly for her name, but it would be nice to have a full detailed rundown. But at least they're being honest. They don't know. I'm not 100% sure either, but I at least saw the brass nut. That's definitely not stock. But I'm kind of surprised that we don't have any neck stamps being visible. She had a Les Paul special, but uh, apparently we can't view that listing anymore because it's sold. That vintage one went for 30000 which, yeah, that's about a, at least a two and a half times premium. There was a Duncan Quattro. She said this was used on certain songs when it was on a stand so she could play keyboard at the same time. And other times it was her dive-bombing 80s style guitar. Yeah, that thing is definitely crazy looking. Looks like it's an HSH setup with a black metallic finish. There's a cute little dinky ES140T. I've always wanted to document one of these things because it's kind of like a mini Les Paul just in semi-hollow format. I mean, that's a pretty cute looking little one. 6,000 bucks, definitely a premium price. But whoa, I like that. That's cool wood grain. Here's a Les Paul special reissue if that $30,000 one was on your radar but you missed it. I'm curious, what year is this one from? This is looking 2000s era inspired to me. I would guess 1999 by this serial number. However, this serial can mean a whole lot of stuff. And I don't have enough information here from this listing to be able to tell you everything. So I would say this is roughly only a two times premium on this particular guitar. Maybe even a little bit less than that. That's a pretty fair price, I would say. Okay, we've got the custom art case that tells us it's 90s into early 2000s. So pretty confident with that 1999 answer. And whoa, a double cut junior. What's the story on this one? Only 15,000? If this is a true vintage one, that's not that bad of a price. 
but it looks like maybe it was refinished, maybe not. The headstock's definitely looking a little bit weird, and this has definitely had a new nut, maybe not so professionally installed. It's had a refret. We no longer have a visible serial number, but it's got the 70s style shawlers on here. I'm sure the price point is indicative of... <laughs> You don't know exactly what this is because it could just be some sort of like a 70s knockoff that has been refinished or something and made to look like a Gibson. I would want to see some more photos on that before dropping money, but it looks like it's already sold. We got a couple of honorable mentions. We have a Fender Telecaster Custom, which is a cool three-tone sunburst finish here. An interesting TV Jones Spectra, which is kind of like a rockabilly archtop guitar, but kind of shrunken down. It really reminds me of like the Chet Atkins classical electric guitars that Gibson made for him towards the end of their run. This is a really cool special double cutaway. I'm surprised that white one sold before this because all this needs to look good again <laughs> is a pick guard, but you kind of just naturally have a red pick guard on it anyway. But that's an interesting layout. I don't think I've ever noticed that before. Yeah, I thought that wasn't right. Normally the toggle switches up here, but this one has like a the Paul style layout. There's got to be a story behind that. I mean, that looks like an original route. That could be a pretty special piece. Once again, we've got the brass nut and it dates to 1959. Cool. There was a cool baritone Stratocaster, which usually baritones look obnoxiously long in the neck, but this one is not. It's just got the F hole on it, which makes it kind of interesting. And of course, you can't have Nancy Wilson without some acoustics, so there's this Taylor 810, which has some interesting built-in pickups here. And then the Beatles guitar here, as she called it. Very early days of Gibson putting electronics in their acoustic models. This one's got a nice character to it. I've always loved the headstocks on these and the weird first fret inlay, Pete Townsend style. And then they had a couple of, like, keyboards and stuff, and a gravichord and some touring cases here if that's up your alley. So what was your favorite Nancy Wilson sold guitar this time? Let me know down in the comment section. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.